Japanese correspondents had none of these problems because Japan made no pretense about the correspondent's role. When a war broke out, a board of information, a Japanese version of the OWI, a Patriotic Critics Association, and a Patriotic Commentators Association were set up to remind people of the reasons for the war and to stress its aims. The Domai News Agency, Radio Tokyo, and all other newspapers were reorganized as, quote, public utilities, end quote, charged with a mission under the wartime structure. A board of censorship with representatives of the Army, Navy, Home Office, and Ministry of Transport looked after censorship in Japan while service censors <sighs> handled the war correspondence copy in the war theaters. There, the Japanese were as obsessed with secrecy as the Americans were. It was a crime to mention even the routine uh, move of an officer. Troops were discouraged from writing letters home, and any criticism of the armed forces, no matter how mild, was not permitted. There was one simple test for a story. Would it contribute directly to the Japanese war effort? Nothing else was to be published. Stories from individual war correspondents had to be sent back by airmail, and by the time they reached Tokyo, they were hopelessly out of date. And the largest media for any information became Radio Tokyo and Domai. Domai not only distributed the news, but also issued orders as to where it should appear in the news paper and what display it should be given. Correspondents were expected to identify with the services by wearing uniform. They were present at most of the major events of the war, but what they wrote was predictably patriotic. At Midway, for example, a Japanese Navy cameraman, Teichi Makashima, filmed the whole battle from an escort ship, but when he got back to Japan, he learned that his film would not be used. Although the Navy had lost all four of the carriers taking part, it was admitting to only one sunk and one damaged, and was claiming a victory. Makishima was not only not only had his film confiscated, but also agreed to be held virtually incommunicado, incommunicado until the end of the war, in case he was tempted to tell anyone the truth. Torao Saito of the Ashahi Shimbun used uh, to visit abandoned Allied military camps in Southeast Asia, gathering all the waste paper that had not been burnt. He took this back to Japan and sifted through it, often finding in service manuals, documents, magazines, or letters, interesting material for his paper. His reports also interested Japanese intelligence, and between 1941 and 1943, Saito spent most of his time on the operation, this operation in interviewing Allied POWs and in writing reports for the Japanese Army and Navy. So Japanese correspondents made no pretense of being other than what they were, an arm of the war effort, and they wrote nothing that did not advance their country's chances of victory. But were Allied correspondents any different? There was one aspect of the war about which correspondents on both sides failed, for patriotic reasons, to write the whole truth. Prisoners of war and the atrocities that inflicted on, that were inflicted on them. The war in the Pacific, unlike the war on the Western Front in Europe, the Russian Front was another matter, had strong racial overtones. British and American propaganda encouraged the Allied troops and the public at home to think of the Japanese as, quote, apes in uniform, end quote, lacking sufficient intelligence to master mechanized warfare, unable to learn pilot planes because they had been strapped to their mother's backs as babies and had thus, thus lost their sense of balance. The danger of propaganda like this is that it dehumanizes the enemy and makes it easier to treat him like an animal 
whose life and feelings are of little value. It was thus inevitable that atrocities occurred, and they occurred on both sides. A trade sprung up among Australians and New Guinea in providing Japanese cars, oh, Japanese ears, usually preserved in spirits as souvenirs for American troops. Americans knocked gold teeth from Japanese dead in the mistaken belief that the fillings were valuable and that they could sell them when on leave. President Roosevelt refused the gift of a paper knife made from the bone of a slain Japanese soldier. MacArthur's intelligence office had a file, number 384, which dealt with Allied war crimes and which included cases of American and Australian cannibalism. One of his officers told me that whereas Japanese cases of cannibalism were frequently the result of necessity, at least one of these cases of Allied cannibalism which he had investigated was the result of a dare or a bet. It was generally accepted by Australian military intelligence that the Japanese sinking of the Australian hospital ship Centaur was in retaliation for the destruction by Amer Australian troops of a Japanese field hospital in New Guinea while the wounded were still in it, but the Australian public was not told this. In Borneo, immediately after the war, Australian troops seeking information about Japanese war crimes made one Japanese person dig his own grave and then kneel beside it while a soldier stood over him with an axe with the apparent intention of beheading him at the last moment it was decided that the japanese knew nothing and he was returned to the prisoner's compound australian troops set upon japanese working parties at sandakan beat men to the ground and then rolled full 44 gallon fuel drums over them they beat Japanese sick and wounded with oars and paddles while loading them onto landing craft in Sendakan Harbor. These individual acts can perhaps be excused as excesses after provocation, but there are also well-documented acts of policy which, had they been known at the time, might have caused some public concern. American submarines sank all Japanese ships on sight irrespective of whether they were carrying passengers or war materials. Even the fact that one ship was sunk turned out to be carrying American prisoners of war caused no change in the policy. Official communiques said that American planes bombed only military objectives in Tokyo and with pinpoint accuracy. In fact, Fire raid bombings were indiscriminate and caused more casualties than the atomic bomb at Hiroshima. At least 250,000 were killed and 8 million made homeless. One raid alone, that of March 10, 1945, killed 140,000 people and left 1 million homeless. Japanese atrocities are well known. The Bataan Death March, the Burma Railway, overcrowding and starvation in POW camps throughout Southeast Asia, the beheading of prisoners, rape and mass executions were all true. This was due in part to the Japanese code of behavior about being taken prisoner, in part to the absence of any Japanese organization to handle POWs, and in part to historical pressures. The Japanese saw prisoners not as people, but as provocative symbols of a detested past. Quote, they had only to look at us for this urge of resentment to quicken in their blood to such an extent, end quote, wrote a former POW, Lorenz van der Post, quote, that I still marvel not so much at the excesses they perpetrated as at their restraint, end quote but it was mainly due to the fact that the Japanese, as sons of heaven, believed themselves to be racially superior to Westerners and came to regard the Allied soldiers as less than human. Neither side reported its own atrocities. Throughout the war, there was not a single mention of Japan or in Japan of any atrocity by a Japanese soldier.
and I have been unable to find any report in the Allied press of an atrocity committed by an Allied soldier. Both sides emphasized atrocities committed by the enemy. Here, the Allies had an advantage in that they could be they could use the brutal treatment of Allied POWs to stimulate hatred of the Japanese. It was a joint United States Army and Navy release in 1944 that coined the expression March of Death to describe what had occurred in Bataan. Japan could not retaliate even by inventing stories about Allied treatment of Japanese POWs because the Japanese government had told its people that no Japanese soldier was ever taken prisoner. All died fighting. Even the POW camp and riot in Australia in 1944, when 221 Japanese prisoners were either shot by Australian troops or killed themselves, was not reported in Japan, even though the Japanese authorities knew about it. However, when the Australians cremated with full honors the bodies of Japanese naval officers killed in midget submarine raid on Sydney, and returned the ashes to Japan. This was widely reported in the Japanese press. When the end of the war produced evidence that not all Allied POWs had suffered at the hands of the Japanese, this was ignored. General Percival, captured at Singapore, to his credit, wrote in 1949, when passions had cooled, an objective account of his POW experiences. He had shared a bottle of whiskey with the camp commandant in Singapore, had traveled in the first officer's cabin on the ship to Japan because he was sick and had received Red Cross stores on arrival at the new camp. In 1943, he was moved to a camp near the capital of Formosa. Each officer had a small room to himself. There was a library of English and American books table tennis, and a gramophone with a good supply of records, which we were able to buy locally. Prisoners received letters. They took a long while in transit, sometimes 18 months to two years, were allowed to write one a month for a period, two English daily newspapers printed in Japan, and a radio, had a radio set, which could receive only Japanese stations. When they were moved to Manchuria, they were given warm clothing and housed in centrally heated barracks. By the autumn of 1943, the United States had regained its strength. The losses sustained at Pearl Harbor had been made good, and there were now the men, planes, and ships to begin the drive on Japan herself. The Americans decided to start by recapturing the islands on the Japanese defensive perimeter since the idea was to gain bases from which their new superfortress bombers could strike at japan the americans were prepared to lose the lives of many men for the sake of a single runway much bloody fighting lay ahead because the japanese were a tenacious fanatical foe and now that the side was clearly running in the americans favor one would have expected the reporting of the war to improve the armed services certainly gave the impression that the correspondent's task would be easier. The United States Pacific Fleet's Public Relations Unit put out a pamphlet addressed to correspondents, offering to, quote, put you on the trail of this story, gold mine, end quote. The unit offered to make arrangements for a correspondent to visit any command, to take photographs, conduct interviews, go to the sea and ships, in short, to do anything for you that will help you get your yarn. The Navy also began to work towards a censorship system under which the Press Relations Division could be headed by an officer of sufficient rank and experience to decide on his own responsibility whether a story could be released. In the end, it made little difference. When a correspondent was lucky enough to be selected for a major assignment, he found himself part of a pool, and his story had to be shared with his colleagues. William F. Tyree of the United Press and a Navy Liberator flying over Iwo Jima 
represents the whole American press when the Americans put ashore one of the largest forces to take part in a single Marine Corps action, and Webley Edwards of CBS represented the radio networks. Joe Rosenthal of the Associated Press, representing the wartime still pictures pool, took the best known photograph of the Pacific War there, the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima. A, ground, a group of Marines struggled to erect a steel pole with the American flag at the highest point of the island. The photograph was used on a postage stamp, became the symbol of the seventh war bond drive, was used on three and a half million posters and 175,000 car cards, and was the inspiration for the hundred ton bronze memorial to the Marines at the edge of Arlington National Cemetery. And it remains a very popular photograph even today. If by some chance a correspondent had a story to tell himself, Distances in the Pacific were so great and communications presented such a problem that he was almost certain to be beaten by the official communique. As Newsweek said, The two most important American war correspondents are the two men who sit in Washington and prepare for the Army and Navy communiques. With more and more newspaper commentators and military experts to quote interpret and quote the news for the public, correspondent found his story becoming a small part of the finished product and although he was on the spot what he contributed was often not allowed to disagree with the official version it was claimed for instance that 19 japanese heavy cruisers had been sunk before the battle of late gulf chiefly by bombers of the macarthur command the japanese had begun war with 18 built none in the intervening period, and yet sailed into the battle with fourteen. The censors struck from correspondence copy all references to the discrepancy. Disheartened, some war correspondents gave up the unequal struggle and went back behind a desk to handle copy from men in the field. This left too many spot news reporters, competent enough at covering a battle or writing a human interest story, but unable to write about the broader horizons of the war. Some were content to sit at headquarters and rewrite official handouts. Others, usually under pressure from their offices, went with the troops and wrote the sort of story that began. I was the first correspondent into Tarara, Tarawa today as the bullets flew. And this dispatch comes to you by PT Boat and Shortwave Radio. This sort of reporting was cleverly parodied by one Australian correspondent, Alan Dawes of the Melbourne Herald. Dawes, a fat, slow man, decided that readers might be well fed up with brave and intrepid correspondents. So in 1943, he wrote a dispatch that began, Somewhere in New Guinea. I was the last correspondent in the lack. He sealed it in an envelope and put it in the force's mailbox. A month later, his newspaper ran the story under the headline, Last Pressman in Delay Post Message. Two defenses are put forward for the overall poor reporting of the war in the Pacific. The first is that newspapers demanded battle descriptions and when a battle correspondent tried to break away from his stereotype, his newspaper became restive and wanted him back where the action was. As a result, correspondents' casualties were proportionately greater than those of any combat service. But here we are interested not in bravery, but in effectiveness. Fletcher Pratt, himself a correspondent and a student of military affairs, has pointed out that Japanese on Atu lost 99.5% of their force, which would entitle them to still higher praise than the war correspondents, but that they, too, failed to achieve their objective. Pratt's conclusion was, The war was reported in terms of a social function by the Fifth Street Ladies' Club, 
The names and addresses were correct, and all the, necess all the necessary ones got in. The phrases were stereotyped, unobjection unobjectionable stencils one should employ on such an occasion. There was almost never any sense of the hurry, passion, and continual surprise that are the essence of real fighting, or the ineffable boredom and desperate devices for self-entertainment that are the focus of preparation for battle. These were left for the trained seals, the stuntmen like Pyle, Lafarge, and Clark Lee. The second defense is to ask how the correspondents could report what was happening when often the military did not know itself, and when the military did, it did not often tell the correspondents until it was ready to do so. The defense carries more, this defense carries more weight. The Battle of Lake Gulf in October 1944, for example, was greatly underrated at the time because the United States Navy did not know what a great victory it had won. George E. Jones of the United Press on board Admiral Mark Mitcher's flagship wrote, Today the Japanese fleet submitted itself to the destinies of war and lost. Four enemy carriers have been sunk. Eight battleships have been damaged. It was as if Jones learned later. Uh, it was, as Jones learned later, a more sweeping defeat for the Japanese than that. Forty Japanese ships had been sunk, forty-six others damaged, and four hundred five planes destroyed. The Japanese fleet, as an offensive force, had been virtually eliminated. In the first and last battle of the Pacific War, to be fought by surface warships, and, the class and in the classical manner, the Navy and Jones were not to realize this, but it was fortunate that the Navy delayed even giving a satisfactory account of what it knew the battle until interest had virtually died. The Navy kept from correspondence the extent to which Japanese suicide pilots, the Kamikaze Corps, were crippling American ships. These attacks started at late in October 1944 and grew in intensity throughout the spring and summer of 1945. At first, all mention of the attacks were banned, on the ground that it would provide the Japanese with a propaganda weapon. At Okinawa, 100 United States ships were lost or damaged in kamikaze attacks. West Coast shipyards were so glutted with damaged ships that some of the worst ones had to be sent to East Coast yards. Clearly, news of the kamikaze could go no longer could no longer be suppressed, so in mid-April, Admiral Chester Nimitz officially announced the bare fact of their existence, and censorship was applied only to details of damage. On May 28th, Phelps Adams of the North American Newspaper Alliance wrote the first detailed account of a kamikaze attack. Adams, on a neighboring carrier, saw two Japanese planes each carrying 1,100 pounds of bombs, plum, plunge into the flight deck of the USS Bunker Hill, Admiral Mitcher's flagship, killing nearly 400 officers and men, and transforming one of our biggest flat tops into a floating torch with flames soaring nearly 1,000 feet in the sky. The bunker limped back to the United States for repairs, so there was nothing to be gained by suppressing Adam's story, and the American reader learned at last the full danger of the kamikaze. It is doubtful whether the British reader learned about the attacks until after the war. With fighting in Europe over and Britain in the middle of a general election campaign, newspapers lost interest in the Pacific until the A-bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Censorship also kept the public kept from the public the full story of the most bizarre weapon of the war. The 9,300 Japanese paper balloons that drifted with the trade winds across the Pacific to bomb the United States. The balloons, the first intercontinental missiles, were 38 feet in diameter and each carried an anti-personnel bomb weighing 35 pounds. They landed as far apart as Alaska and Mexico,
and a few reached Iowa. The military results were minor, but they killed six people, caused much anxiety and uncertainty, tied up considerable forces of men, radar, and fighter aircraft, and eventually disappeared only because the B-29 raids on Japan disrupted their supplies of hydrogen gas. Little was published at the time, only brief details after the war, and the full story was not told until 1973, not counting anything that's emerged since. Another story suppressed by censorship concerned American-Australian relations. Ill feeling between the troops of the two countries reached such an intensity that in the so-called Battle of Brisbane in 1942, an American MP shot and killed one Australian soldier and wounded eight others in the Rockhampton, Queensland railway station. The following year, a trainload of Australian commandos on their way to the battle zone fought a pitched battle with a trainload of GIs returning south on leave. The full story of these events did not emerge until more than 30 years later. However, there was no holding back news when it involved a publicity-conscious general like MacArthur. When he returned to the Philippines on the morning of October 20, 1944, and waded ashore, not at just one beach, but at several in succession, there were correspondents, cameramen, and uh, MacArthur's own personal photographer to make certain that the event was recorded for history and reported widely. Generals and admirals had a right to enjoy their successes, but the picture of the war would have been more balanced and perhaps more human if the correspondents had not gone along with public relations view that the troops were led by the finest soldiers since Alexander the Great and that the United States forces were nearly as perfect as possible, no cowards, no excessive drinking, no immoral behavior, no black marketeers, no looting and no theft, it would have been too much to expect a little debunking. Yet, after the war, John Steinbeck wrote, referring to the European theater, but no doubt it applied equally to the Pacific, We knew that a certain very famous general officer constantly changed press agents because he felt he didn't get enough headlines. We knew the commander who broke a signal corps sergeant for photographing his wrong profile. Several fine field officers were removed from their commands by the jealousy of their superiors because they aroused too much admiration from the reporters. There were consistent sick leaves, which were gigantic hangovers, spectacular liaisons by army brass and WAACs, medical discharges for stupidity, brutality, cowardice, and even sex deviation. I don't know of a single reporter who made use of any of this information. Apart from wartime morale, it would have been professional suicide to have done it. But why were there not more newspapers like the Christian Science Monitor, which told its correspondent to play down adventure and hometown boy becomes hero stories and concentrate on the significance of the war, to quote, keep the long-range meaning in view and write about it, end quote. Or more news cameraman like Damien Perrer, an Australian, whose determination to convey exactly what the war was like, without glamour, fake shots, or false look at our happy boys at the front propaganda, did not please the Australian Department of Information. It interfered in his work to such an extent that Perrer later resigned and went to work for Paramount, only to suffer guilt feelings for having, as he put it, sold out to the Yanks. Perrer was killed by a Japanese machine gun fire in the Palu Islands on September 17, 1944. As it was, the failure of the correspondents to see the broader issues of the war, their emphasis on battle, bravery, glory, and adventure, plus the stultifying effects of censorship, meant that two major stories of the latter stages of the Pacific Campaign the United States submarine offensive against Japanese oil tankers, which largely won the war, and the development and use of the atom bomb were poorly reported. 
the successes of the United States Navy in denying Japan her vital oil supplies is told in one simple table of figures. Of what was produced in the southern oil fields that Japan had conquered, the following amounts reached Japan. In 1942, 40%. In 1943, 15%. And in 1944, 5%. In 1945, none. This was what really defeated Japan. With or without the atom bomb, the Russian entry into the Pacific War, or the great naval battles, Japan was finished because her ships, aircraft, tanks, and vehicles could not move. They had no fuel. This classic case of strategic warfare went unreported at the time because of a Navy Department directive that nothing should be written about submarines. Several correspondents wrote long and detailed stories on the daring achievements of American submarines against Japanese shipping, but the Navy Department refused to pass them. After the war, a censor wrote, large sections of the material not only continued no security, contained no security information, but would have given the American people cause for rejoicing over sweeping naval successes. The atomic bomb was a different matter. Its development had been kept secret, and even its testing in New Mexico on July 16, 1945, was successfully passed off on an unsuspecting public by a lazy press as, quote, an ammunition dump explosion with no loss of life and little damage to property. But there was no chance of keeping secret the use of the bomb on Hiroshima. On August 6th, President Truman announced the dropping of the bomb 16 hours later and specified the nature of the weapon. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe the force from which the sun draws its power and has been loosed against those who have brought the war to the far east. Radio Tokyo, on August 8th, gave some idea of the bomb's effect. Quote, the impact of the bomb was so terrible that practically all living things, human and animal, were literally seared to death by the tremendous heat and pressure engendered by the blast, end quote. The Soviet press reported the bomb in a short item buried away with minor news and did not report the second bomb at Nagasaki at all. Ben Nakamura, a reporter with the Domei Agency Hiroshima branch, survived the blast, gathered as much information as he could, and got out the first eyewitness account of what had occurred. He even included a little speculation as to what could have caused such devastation. Fantastic though it must have seemed to him at the time, Nakamura wrote, it might have been an atomic bomb. By the end of the week, in September, three weeks after Japan had surrendered, and nearly a month after Hiroshima, there still had been no account by a Western correspondent of the effects of the atom bomb on the two Japanese cities. General MacArthur had placed all southern Japan off-limits to the press and, instead of ending censorship, had tightened it. The, the Army's, Army's Press Relations Division was doing its best to push correspondents north to the newly liberated POW camps for what one correspondent called the Look Mom, I'm Free story. But... Clearly, even MacArthur could not keep the world's press away from Hiroshima indefinitely. On September 3rd, Wilfred Burchett of the London Daily Express arrived in Hiroshima after a 21-hour train journey from Tokyo. Burchett spent the morning surveying the ruins of the city and then handed his story to the Domei Agency, which sent it by Morse code to Tokyo where it was relayed to London. Later that same day, the American correspondents arrived, flown in by the United States Air Force. The colonel in charge of this group was so annoyed to find Burchett already there that he refused to give him a lift back to Tokyo or even to carry a duplicate copy of Burchett's story. <laughs>
To their credit, two of the American correspondents, Homer Bigger and Bill Lawrence, protested about this treatment of Burchett. His story, with some of the most horrifying details cut out, appeared in the Daily Express on September 5th, an historic exclusive. In Hiroshima, 30 days after the first atomic bomb destroyed the city and shook the world, people are still dying, mysteriously and horribly. People who were uninjured in the cataclysm from an unknown something which I can only describe as the atomic plague. Hiroshima does not look like a bombed city. It looks as if a monster steamroller had passed over it and squashed it out of existence. I write these facts as dispassionately as I can in the hope that they will act as a warning to the world. Burchett's report was the first to describe radiation sickness. The American authorities reacted quickly. Army press relations called a conference in Tokyo to refute Burchett's account. There was no such thing as radiation sickness, the spokesman said. Burchett arrived back in Tokyo to walk into the conference just in time to hear the spokesman accuse him of falling victim to the Japanese propaganda. Hiroshima was put out of bounds to all correspondents. Burchett was served with an expulsion order, later rescinded after U.S. Navy intervened on his behalf, and in the United States, General, Major General Leslie R. Groves, head of the Manhattan Project, as the program for the development of the bomb had been known, declared flatly, This talk about radioactivity is so much nonsense. To prove it, he invited a group of correspondents to New Mexico to inspect the site of the test explosion. The correspondents came away far from happy. They had to wear shields over their shoes so that the radioactive earth would not stick to their soles. When they had been followed by men with Geiger counters, and they had been warned not to carry any souvenirs of fused earth unshielded near the skin. But the dropping of the first atomic atom bomb was a story too big to be handled as hard news, too important to be treated solely from a scientific point of view. Over the months, millions of words were written on every aspect except the obvious one. What was it like to be in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945? In May 1946, the New Yorker decided to remedy this by sending the author and correspondent John Hersey to find out what had happened at Hiroshima and describe what survivors had seen and felt and thought and to tell of the coming of the atomic age, what that had meant, not in terms of scientific marvels, but in terms of human suffering. The New Yorker devoted its entire issue of August 31st to Hersey's brilliant 30,000-word account, which related in straight narrative form and in a sober, matter-of-fact style what happened to six ordinary Hiroshima people on the extraordinary day. The story created sensation, the issue sold out in hours, and the report was serialized in other magazines and newspapers, broadcast by the ABC in the United States and the BBC in Britain, and published as a book, Hiroshima, all over the world. It remains one of the literary classics of the war. On September 2nd, 1945, General MacArthur, his hands ostentatiously stuck in his pockets, accepted Japan's surrender in Tokyo Bay on board the USS Missouri, a battleship that had survived Pearl Harbor. Meanwhile, General Stilwell toured the war ruins, gloating over the destruction. A Domai correspondent wrote, quote, We await the will of our new masters, end quote. In the euphoria of victory, the war was hailed as the best reported in history, and there was little of the deep soul-searching that had followed the First World War. Yet, if we take away the few exceptional correspondents, the ones who believed that in a democracy the people need facts to make decisions, even in time of war, perhaps especially in time of war, if we take away the few that felt it, if the censors were to dictate the coverage,
then it would be better to have no coverage at all. What are we left with? The war against Japan was waged by Demo a democratic alliance, but the coverage of war against Japan, uh, the coverage of the war, particularly in its early stages, was not so remarkably better in the United States than it was in Japan, with what were, no doubt, the best of motives. Most Allied correspondents in the Pacific acquiesced in a system that gave the illusion of providing a free and open coverage of the war and its conduct. In fact, the result was the same as the system adopted in Japan. The public received only that news of the war which its government considered advisable to tell it. And that is the end of that chapter. And thank you very much. If you enjoyed it, please hit like and subscribe. Bye.